Well, hi, everyone. I'm giving this on the eve of the what we, what we call the eighth day, the feast that comes right after the Feast of Tabernacles. Sometimes it's been called, many, many years, it's been called the last great day. I, I call it what the Bible calls it, the eighth day. And I believe the last great day is not the eighth day. But anyway, uh, most of us have probably lost somebody, a relative, a good friend, a neighbor, somebody who never really came to accept Jesus as their Savior. And maybe some, like I say, were relatives. And maybe on top of that, be before they died, you knew that they were people who were drunks or unfaithful or liars or corrupt, whatever. And you're kind of worried because the world has taught you that they're probably suffering in hell right now. What happens to them after they die? What future can they possibly have? If they haven't accepted Jesus and they lived a life that was dominated by sin. And for some of you, you may have uh, even lost some who've died who did claim Jesus as their Savior, but they didn't believe the same beliefs you have quite exactly. So you wonder, well, what's exactly going to happen to those people? We'll talk about all that and much, much more. What about babies and so on, okay? This day, which the Bible calls the eighth day, that's the name the Bible gives it, is about new beginnings. Eight, the number eight, is always about new beginnings. Uh, breaking with the old, starting something new. Eight is for new. So you had eight in the ark. You had um, the ark that Noah, you know, Noah's ark. You had David, the eighth son of Jesse, uh, who, became, who started a brand new dynasty. The eighth day starts a new week. The new covenant um, scriptures, the New Testament, was written, penned. It's written by God, but penned by eight men, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Paul, Peter, Jude, and James. So, um, and Luke, of course, did the book of Acts as well. Now, this day is about uh, when God makes all things new, Re Revelation 21.5, including the future of billions of people. Leviticus 23, verses 36, verse 36, and then later on we'll read 39. It, it talks about the Feast of Tabernacles. And for seven days you shall offer an offering made by fire to Jehovah, to the Lord. On the eighth day today, that, I'm, that you'll be hearing this, uh, which starts the eve before the eighth day, okay? Sabbaths always begin the eve of. You shall have a holy convocation, a holy get-together, a holy coming together. And offer an offering, and so it shall be a sac sacred assembly, and you shall do no customary work on it. So eighth day, that's what this day is called correctly. In verse 39, and also on the 15th day of the seventh month, the Hebrew seventh month, which is usually uh, mid-September or later, when you've gathered in the fruit of the land, you shall keep the feast. It's, a, it's actually a, a, a moed, a, a holy assembly, an appointed time with God, there are two words. One is moed, appointment with God. The other word is chag, which means a feast, food and water and delighting, delightful times. And you shall offer an offering, okay? It's a sacred assembly. Uh, I've read that already. Let's go back to verse 39. When you've gathered in the fruit, you shall keep the feast of the Lord for seven days. And on the first day, there shall be a Sabbath rest. And on the eighth day, a Sabbath rest. Shabbat Shabbaton. Uh, Sabaton, uh, which is a Sabbath of Sabbaths, is what it means. It's a very, very strong Sabbath. Several of the holy days are Shabbat Sabbatons. When Solomon dedicated his temple, the house of God that he had built, all Israel with him, uh, it says there came, I, I'm reading now 2 Chronicles 7, verses 8 and 9. At that time, Solomon kept the feast, the Feast of Tabernacles, for seven days, so what's the last day of a seven-day feast, right? I kept the feast for seven days and all Israel with him and a very great assembly uh, from the entrance of Hama to the brook of Egypt. And on the eighth day, today, on the eighth day, they held a sacred assembly for they observed the dedication of the altar seven days and the feast for seven days. Nehemiah 8.18 says they kept the feast of tabernacles seven days a sacred assembly on the eighth day. So I'm trying to differentiate this from the, the Feast of Tabernacles. 
Isaiah 43, verses 18 and 19, I'll read the first part. Do not remember the former things, nor consider the things of old. Don't even go back. Behold, I will do a new thing, God says, okay? It goes on from there. So to me, this day is not just another holy day. It's a day I delight in. It's a day that hurts as well. Because you see, to this day, the eighth day, and all that it will picture as I'll explain, to me this day is our son, David. It's not a doctrinal belief for me. It is, but it's not my focus. He died so very, very young. When Carol and I were just 29 years old, the shock and the pain was beyond description, and since then I've lost my father the next year when I was 30, and then when I was 40 I lost my mom, and then my wife lost her mom and dad here in the last few years. I lost my sister a few years ago, quite a few uncles and aunts, cousins and so forth, and all of the others put together didn't come close, frankly, to the pain that I felt losing our son. So what's going to happen to my son David? I named my two sons David and Jonathan. I still have Jonathan, but David is gone. What happens to those who died so young without their Savior? Now, one year I remember overhearing one of our speakers, a minister, a pastor, who was to cover the meaning of the eighth day. And he was kind of bored by it, wondering, well, what am, I, what am I going to do? What am I going to say that's different, that's exciting? How can I make it interesting? I overheard him saying to another minister. I didn't say anything, but he seemed so bored by what really should be a very, very exciting day. So let's not get so tied down in details that we forget the real personal meaning, especially, especially of this day for people who've lost loved ones. Well, to me, so it's not just a sermon. To me, as I'll explain more and more as we go along, this day is about being with our son again and many others. Now at the Feast of Tabernacles, as we go through the feast, we're meeting new people, we're getting to become friendly with some, we really like that couple, that family, that person, and, it, it, it's, and we're hearing great sermons, I hope you have been. And we're already feeling sad. You mean we're already at day six, day seven, tomorrow's day eight, and so on. I know when I was 14, 15, 16 years old keeping the feast, I'm 70 now, in 2023, and, you know, I, I'd become very good friends with some boys and girls, and, and, and they'd be gone soon, and they didn't live near us. And I remember feeling a sadness that everyone's going to leave soon. And then they had this tradition that I'd like to start in Kenya and other places. The very last song on the eighth day was, God be with you till we meet again. You know the song. God be with you till we meet again. Right? You know that song. It felt sad, and many sang it with tears rolling down their faces. Um, but for us, that won't be sung until tomorrow night, those of you in Kenya. Remember, too, we keep these... By the way, if any of you who, have, who helped us help the people of Kenya have a feast in the first place, uh, for many of them their first feast, thank you. Thank you from the bottom of our hearts and their hearts. Thank you. Thank you so much. If any of you would like to continue to help us help those people in Kenya who are so poor, really, to be able to function and have life, have a life of, uh, it's not even at all comparable to what we have here in the West as far as physical things go, but they're very zealous and they enjoy the word, the word of God. I'd be welcoming your help is what I'm saying. Just go to Light on the Rock and the donate button under About and thank you. That's up to you. I'm not asking you to, but I'm Telling you I'd be very happy if you would. <laughs> anyway, so remember we keep the holy days also partly to remind us to be zealous about God and excited about what his plans are to save as many people uh, as possible. Save the whole world. The holy days show us that. And so by going through them every year, it reminds us, oh yeah, yeah, I, I remember now the eight days, this and that. Most of Christianity teaches us, though, that we have an immortal soul that doesn't die, can't die. And they teach that when we die, I'm saying the majority of Christianity, this is not what I believe. Soul just means our being, our innermost being. 
I think it's more than just a life, but it's not immortal, okay? That, but but uh, they teach that when we die, our immortal soul, they, they teach, goes either instantly to heaven or down to Hades, down to the grave, or to hell, I mean, to Gehenna, to hellfire. But actually what Scripture teaches is that when someone dies, righteous or wicked, they're, they're going into the ground into a kind of a sleep. No, the Bible says so many places that even Jesus said about Lazarus, he sleeps. Well, let's leave him. He needs to sleep if he's sick. Then Jesus said in John 11, I'm telling you, Lazarus is dead. He died. No man has ascended to heaven. Jesus said in John 3, 13, no man has, a, has gone to heaven except me, he says, who's been there. Peter says not even King David is in, is in heaven. Not even King David. Write this down and look it up. If you don't believe me, Acts 2, 34. So what's the truth of what happens when we die? I'm going to give a whole sermon on it, so I'm not going to dwell on that part here. But just, just to know that, that we don't go to heaven, we don't go to hell. Okay? There's a spirit in man that goes back to God. I'll come to that in a minute. So what's happened so far as we come to this point in the holy days? And what do the four fall feasts show us? Okay, first of all, we have the Passover season and the Days of Unleavened Bread. It, uh, God's plan of salvation begins with Yeshua, with Jesus. He dies for us. He takes the death penalty upon himself voluntarily. We have to accept it. We have to ask him to cover us with his life. And so that's Passover in the Days of Unleavened Bread. It opens up the whole world of possibilities to us. Then we come 50 days later to Pentecost, and the giving of God's law and giving of God's Holy Spirit in the New Covenant. And we believe, a lot of us believe, because that day is also called the Feast of Weeks, seven weeks plus a day. So it's also called the Feast of First Fruits, Day of First Fruits. And so uh, we're called the First Fruits in James 1.18 and so many other places. We're called the First Fruits. God's not calling everybody right now. He's harvesting just the first fruits right now. And doesn't it make sense that the resurrection happens on the day of first fruits, Pentecost? And then we go to heaven, pictured by the two wave loaves raised up high, on the day of Pentecost, and, and, and then eventually come back down again. But while we're up there, seven last plagues are being poured out here on earth. While we're up there, we're probably going through ceremonies of being given our, our new name. We're being told what our assignments are. And, and this kind of thing's happening. So um, we're being introduced to our guardian angels and to other people we're going to be working with on teams. And we have the marriage supper of the Lamb going on as well. And then finally, the uh, seven last plagues have, have gone and done their bit. So now we come back down to earth, land on the Mount of Olives, probably on the Day of Trumpets with all of the warfare going on and the destruction, the mayhem in the skies, volcanoes and hurricanes and tornadoes and man-made war and EMPs, you know, the impulses that will destroy anything electronic. So we won't be able to use our watches, our garage doors, turn on our car or find our calculator or our cell phones. We won't know what day it is, especially it says the day will be like night. And so we'll have no idea of the passing of time. So trumpets, the unknowable day, will still be a day that we'll wonder. I wonder if this is trumpets or not. That's what I'm trying to say. And then we come to Day of Atonement. And King Jesus uh, begins the lengthy process, frankly, of, of uh, reconciling with the whole world. It doesn't happen overnight. It takes Egypt several years, we're told in prophecy, for them to come up and keep the Feast of Tabernacles. It's lengthy because it's free moral agency. He won't force anybody. Revelation 20, the first three verses, says Satan is bound. Bound. He's not set loose to be freeing, wandering, uh, like, like one of the goats did. And, no, he's bound and chained in a deep hole, abyss, bottomless pit. There's no sins placed upon him. He can't take any sins. He's had too many of his own. And then, uh, so, so you can read that. It's being posted here. 
Revelation 21 to 3. I saw an angel coming down from heaven, the key of the bottomless pit, great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who's the devil and Satan, bound him for a thousand years, cast him into the bottomless pit. But then it says at the end, he will be released again shortly. Because the world, uh, during a thousand years, anybody who, who's been born and raised during the millennium will never have encountered his temptations and his attitudes. And we have to face him and defeat him. So now the troublemaker is bound. The Feast of Tabernacles is for seven days. By the way, when he goes into the abyss, that place, the bottomless pit called the abyss in Luke 8, verse 30 to 33. When Jesus cast the demons out of the man named Legion, Legion meant thousands of demons that he had. Uh, they begged Jesus, please don't send us to the abyss, to the bottomless pit. I guess there's some really bad demons in there. Revelation 9 talks about that and how even that abyss will be opened up before Christ returns. Horrible time, horrible attitudes. I mean, you might have, it seems to me like God has already uh, released more demonic activity, uh, an attitude that is permeating the whole world. Things have definitely changed in the last three years. They definitely have since 2020. Anyway, so then I saw thrones in verse 4 now, Revelation 20. Judgment was committed to them. They saw souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God who had not worshipped the beast or his image, had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. And they reigned with Christ and lived with him for a thousand years. Now notice the wording in Revelation 20 verse 5. But the rest of the dead did not live again. So there's a first resurrection, and it says the rest of the dead did not live again. So when it says first resurrection here in a minute, it's heavily implying there are more resurrections to come after the thousand years. Verse 5 again, the rest of the dead did not live again till the thousand years were finished. Then he says what he's just talked about was the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he who's part of the first the better resurrection, as Hebrews says, over such the second death has no power. You won't be able to be killed or to die. Once you're in the first resurrection, you will be immortal. You're priest of God. You're going to reign with him a thousand years. So what did we just read? We just read that those belonging to God have been resurrected to immortal life. Death cannot touch them. So we arrive back at earth on Mount of Olives, probably on trumpets, and it's already, already after the wedding that's up there in heaven, probably on the sea of glass, and uh, God the Father present. Matthew 22 says in verse 1, a great king put on a wedding for his son, and later on you see that the king shows up during the wedding, he's there, and the the king is God the Father, the Son is Jesus Christ, obviously. And where is the Father? We pray, our Father in heaven, in heaven. So anyway, we come back. We're going to help rebuild the planet to become like it was in the beginning after God had, re God had fixed, the, the, the renewed the surface. As it says in Psalms, he renews the face of the earth. The Garden of Eden. But it won't be just... God could. He could just say, boom, let it be Garden of Eden everywhere. He could, but it won't happen that way. I'm very sure of that. Mankind, I'm sure, will have to be part of rebuilding what they messed up. So we'll be part of that rebuilding. We'll be part of... It's going to be a mess. It's going to be a mess. You know, the mess after a tornado. The mess after a hurricane. The mess after a tsunami, or the mess in big wars. Hiroshima, what did it look like? Nagasaki, what did parts of Ukraine look like? It's a mess. Plus, on top of that, there'll be possible scenarios where people can't find their families. Or they're wondering if their son or daughter or mom or dad is still alive. 
we will be having to win the hearts and minds of people back to us. Because when we came down to earth, remember the whole world fought us. Then they were all killed, the ones around Jerusalem, and all the way up to the north in the Galilee and in the Megiddo area. <clears throat> so we have to win them back. The way you win people back is to show love and concern. And so, oh yes, I know exactly where your son is because we'll be spirit and have all the qualities of being spirit. And so we reunite these families. Some of them might have a, an amputated arm from, the, from battle or whatever. So we'll be healing the wounded. We'll be restoring their arms and legs and their eyesight. There are verses in Isaiah 35. Isaiah 11, that talk about the blind shall see, the dumb shall sing. You'll be doing that. You'll be healing people like that. You'll be providing peace and safety if they're afraid to follow Christ and follow you because they've been threatened by people who said, if you follow them, we'll torture you. And you can say, you know, I already know who those people are. Just wait a minute. And you and some angels go down there and visit these people show them a little bit of power and love. You guys quit that now because I have the power to make it very hard on you. I have the power to bless you and to make everything go right for you. But if I see you anywhere near these other people, I'm going to protect them and you're going to be in trouble. We might just show them what a blast from our fingertips could look like. Now, I don't want to hurt you, but I'm protecting those who are coming back to us. And we'll be helping Israelites who've been scattered all over the globe as slaves to come back from that captivity. A lot of rebuilding, a lot of reshaping going on. So everything I've said so far is about the millennium. We're not even into day eight yet. So after that beginning, what else will we be doing? Well, Isaiah 11 talks about King David ruling over Israel. Isaiah 2, Micah 4 speaks of all the nations coming to Israel to learn the ways of the king. And you probably had some good sermons during this feast. And then we have the one more holy day. The thousand years is finally over. It's over. And Revelation 20, verse 5, the rest of the dead. Now the eighth day is the day after the Feast of Tabernacles, after the thousand years. The rest of the dead did not live again till the thousand years are finished. And then Re Revelation 20, verse 7 to 10. Um, it says there, Revelation 20, verses 7 to 10, Now when the thousand years have expired, the thousand years is gone, Satan will be released from his prison and go to deceive the nations. Immediately, he goes all over the whole world. And like the old Gog and Magog, he, scatter, he gathers people from all over as the sands of the sea. Hundreds of thousands of them, maybe millions. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. And fire came down from God and out of heaven and devoured them. Revelation 20 verse 10, the devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet had been, there's no R there in the original Greek, and will be tormented, Satan will be, not the two men who were burned up, will be tormented day and night, forever and ever. So even with all the good news of what's been happening during the millennium, once Satan gets his evil thoughts and his demons probably out with him, going again, people who had never encountered Satan's Thoughts and temptations and bad attitudes and lusts and hates and so forth. Revenge and all the evil things. They'd never encountered that before. I'm sure we would have taught them that, hey, this day is coming. And when it comes, you have to fight it. You have to overcome it. Resist it and he'll flee from you. And all the things we read in the Bible. Resist the devil. He'll flee from you. That day is coming soon. We'll be telling them. But he's so successful in deceiving people who have not been sold yet, who have not agreed yet in their hearts and minds that they really want to do the ways of God. 
So that's why God has to release Satan, because all those people born and raised in the millennium had never met him before, had never had to face him and defeat him before. So he can't give those people eternal life until they all face him and say, no, we're not going to go your way, Satan. We like the way of God Almighty through Jesus Christ, through Yeshua. So remember the thousand years is over already when this happens, this big battle and Satan being released and finally Satan being put back into the lake of fire forever and ever. Now we get into the meaning of the eighth day. We're about to read what happens. I call it the second resurrection. The Bible nowhere calls it that. The Bible calls the first one the first one. And we already read how <clears throat> the rest of the dead do not live till a thousand years are over. So if there's another resurrection, the next one would be called the second one. So that's what we call it. Although that term is not used in the Bible. So later, with a period of time between them, a thousand years, between the first and this next one. Remember, those in the first resurrection are immortal. And we, were, we just read, the rest of the dead do not live again till the thousand years are over. So this first resurrection, and then there's the next one calling the second. So let's see what it says here. But before we get to that, I need to make this really plain. If you read all the scriptures about resurrections, you find that prior to Revelation 20, Jesus even, in the Bible, basically just throws out a simple concept that there's a good resurrection and there's a bad resurrection. There's a resurrection for the just and for the unjust. There's a resurrection to life and there's a res resurrection to condemnation. And then when they asked Jesus in Luke 20, what happens to a, um, but anyway, somebody marries and then their spouse dies and then marries a second and they die, third and they die, fourth and they die. Who's, who will marry? Who will they marry in the resurrection? And Jesus says in Luke 20, yeah, yeah, I know in this age people marry and are given in marriage, but in the age to come, if you're counted worthy to attain that age, the resurrection from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, nor can they die anymore. So that's talking obviously about the first resurrection, for they're like or equal to the angels. We're not equal in authority. The angels are our servants, it says in Hebrews 2. But anyway, they're, they're sons of God. So there's a general, some general statements being made there. And Jesus initially kept it real simple. John 5, 28, 29. Don't marvel at this. The hour is coming when everyone in the grave will hear his voice and some will come and, and, and come out, come forth. Those who've done good to the resurrection of life and those who've done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. Now, when you just read those, you do get the idea that it's bang instantly. You're either going to have eternal life or, or, condemn, or be condemned. Before resurrecting Lazarus, Lazarus uh, Jesus had a, a nice talk with Martha, his sister. And uh, he says to her in John eleven twenty three, 23, Yeshua, Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha, we sometimes are hard on Martha because she was more concerned about getting the, uh, getting the, the meal on than, than listening to Yeshua. But look at her faith and her strength here. John eleven twenty four. 24, Martha said to him, I know that he'll rise again at the resurrection of the last day. Jesus said, I am that resurrection. I'm the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. That's in John 11, verse 25, I've been reading. And 26. Now add to this the right understanding of what happens when we die. We don't go straight to heaven. We don't go straight to hell. The spirit in man, the spirit in man that we all have, goes to God, 
who gave it. And I'll read those in just a second. Remember what Jesus said as far as what happens when we die. Jesus said, no man has ever ascended to heaven. No one has. John 3, 13. The righteous dead are in a sleep. Even said Lazarus was asleep. Paul in 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 13 and 15, 17 talks about, now we will not precede those. We won't go ahead of those who sleep, who are dead. Okay? It's like a sleep. Ecclesiastes 3, verses 20, 21. Ecclesiastes 3, 20 and 21. All go to one place. All are from the dust and all return to dust. Who knows the spirit of the sons of men, which goes upward, and the spirit of the animal, which goes down to the earth. Then the dust will return to the earth as it was. Ecclesiastes 12, 7 now. And the spirit will return to God who gave it. That's what happens when we die. I just thought of a verse. I don't think I wrote it down, but the, uh, the ruler of the synagogue had a daughter who had died. And uh, it says when Jesus prayed for her and touched her, um, it says her spirit returned to her. and She came back to life. Okay. I'll try to put that in the notes as to where that was. I think that's in Luke somewhere. So we're called first fruits, but only the first of the first fruits, and that was Jesus, but only after Jesus is what I mean. After Jesus, who was the very first. In Romans 8, 29. Romans 8, 29. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. Talking about what God does with us that he, the Christ, might be the firstborn among many brethren, many brothers and sisters. Many. Many means you, me. No matter where you are around the world hearing me. And Jesus is called the first fruits, the first. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 20 to 23. But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the firstfruits of those who've fallen asleep. Here we have the sleep again. He's the firstfruits. I like to call it the first of the firstfruits, because we are also called firstfruits. For since by one man came death, so by man also came the resurrection of the dead. As in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. 1 Corinthians 15, 23. But each one in his own order, Christ the firstfruits. Afterwards, those who are Christ were also called firstfruits in the rest of the Bible. Afterwards, those who are Christ at his coming. So through Christ, we have the resurrection for ourselves. But him, he's first. We're also firstfruits. James 1.18 says that, the end of it. James 1.18 so there's nobody right now being tortured in hellfire. If you've been worried about your uncle so and so, man, was he a drunk or womanizer or whatever. There's no one right now being tortured in hell. There's no one right now sitting on clouds playing harps in heaven. No one. The spirit in man has gone back to heaven, which is a record a perfect record of everything you are and have been and said and thought and done and who you are. That's in God's hands. But after our death, we have no thoughts, it says in some places in the Bible. The dead know nothing. Okay, the dead know nothing. So now we come to Revelation 20. And remember that nobody right now is being tortured. The wages of sin is death. It is not as taught out there, the wages of sin is eternal life being tortured in a hell fire by a God who says he is love. And they define death as separation from God. That's not death. Malachi 4 verse 3 the, says the wicked will be like ashes under the feet, under the soles of the righteous. S-O-L-E-S, soles, feet, shoes of the righteous. 
Now, Revelation 20, verse 5, let's read that again in 6. The rest of the dead did not live again till the thousand years were over. And uh, those in the first resurrection will never die. Now let's pick up the second resurrection. This is the hope of this day. Revelation 20, verse 11 and 12. Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat on it, that'd be Jesus Christ. Father hasn't returned yet. From whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. So much brilliance that you can't see anything. And there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great. Alexander the Great, won't feel so great here. Standing before God. And books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. Now, isn't that interesting? All these dead people come up. There's a book open. There's another book open, the book of life. The dead were judged according to their works by the things written in the books. Now notice this, uh, those who had not been in the first resurrection are brought back to life again. This is physical life. And read verse 12. They're standing before the throne. And in modern translations, um, it says the throne, but in the New King James, it says before God in, in verse 12. But anyway, books are open. The Greek here for books is biblion. Biblion. It means volumes, documents, books, uh, documents, and so on. It's the same word used for the Holy Biblion, the Holy Bible, the Holy Books. Are you getting what I'm saying here? The Bible's opened up. And according to what the Bible says, they're all judged and shown by your works. Not very good, you guys. Now what? So now Jesus says, you've all earned death. But if you would do what my bride did and repent of your sins, accept me as your Savior, you can be saved from that. You don't have to die. I died for you if you accept that. Now from Adam till now, we don't know how many people have lived. Some say 20, 25, 30, 40 billion. Will all 40 billion be raised up at the same time? I personally doubt it. Now here again, we're not given the details. God is a God of order. Remember, even in 1 Corinthians 15, it says each in his own order. So it makes sense to me that this will be staggered resurrections. First this one, sometime later the next one. And, and they'll have time to live and be taught. And then the next one, then the next one, then the next one. But not all at once, I don't think. The Bible doesn't say either way. Maybe God will say all those who lived pre-flood will come up in this first res in this resurrection here. Not the first one, but the one that it happens at first. And then all those from the flood till Israel was a nation. And then from Israel to the New Testament. Who knows how he'll do it? It makes more sense. Rather than trying to feed and clothe and teach and be with 40 billion people, to me it makes more sense that there's a series of resurrections and being taught and being having the Bible open to them, to their understanding. It would be very unfair of God to have people condemned if they never had their minds opened, if God had never called them. Jesus himself said, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. John 6, 44, you all know that. And John 6, 65 also says that. But anyway, so God now opens their mind to understand the Bible. And they had to be first called by God, and then the minds opened to understand it. Now it's being a lot more fair. God is a God of order. And uh, so as, after he explains the whole process, and he says what happens then is, I have another book here called the Book of Life. Your names are not in it yet. But if you accept me as your Savior, 
we could put your names in there because it would be so unfair of God to just send everybody to the lake of fire because they hadn't accepted Jesus, who maybe never even heard the name of Jesus. People all over the world never heard the name Jesus, Yeshua, anything like that. How fair would that be of God to just condemn the lake of fire without that? So anyway, I believe with all my being. Now, by the way, you who are being called now, you who have the Holy Spirit, you who have been enlightened, this is your day of salvation. This is your only day of salvation. The rest of the world has not all been, have not all been called yet. Okay, so I hope you understand that. So this book of life is opened. Now, so many of you who've lost loved ones, car accidents, cancers, and disease, maybe it was a loved son or daughter, father or mother, they died of all kinds of different issues. They're dead. You will see your loved ones again. And you absolutely will. You might even be allowed by God to help or be part of their resurrection. After all, God let Peter resurrect somebody. He let Paul resurrect different ones. Elisha did, Elijah. So, you know, so different ones resurrected people. Elisha certainly did. And as these people are resurrected, you might be there, I might be there in front of my very own David. Maybe my wife with me there. I don't know how that will all be. This is all speculation. But whatever he died of, he will be perfectly healthy this time. No, and, and people who died of severe pain, people who died of cancer and painful cancer, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, leukemia, breathing disorders, cancers of all kinds are so painful sometimes. I remember as a young minister, I was about 23 or 24 years old, went to go visit this lady in the hospital in the church. I don't know if she even knew I was there. She was under so much uh, medication to sedate her, to not feel so much pain, but it wasn't working very well. Because as I held her hand, I remember her just saying, oh, the pain, the pain, it hurts, it hurts. How I would have loved to have healed her right then and there. I prayed, but it, she wasn't healed. But when she's resurrected, whether in first or second resurrection, her body will be well, no more pain, perfectly healthy. What about all the abortion babies or miscarriages? I don't think any man or woman can end someone else's eternal chances of eternal life. So I personally believe that any abortion, aborted babies, fetuses, will be somehow brought back to life somehow, some way. I'm just speculating. I don't believe God would give anybody the power to stop eternity for somebody that was begotten. So I think they will have a chance to be in a resurrection. And I think possibly even miscarriages. After our David died, we lost two more in miscarriages. So we don't know. And you don't either. But we'll see. We'll have to wait and see. But what about the terribly, terribly wicked people that never seem to come to Jesus? Uh, terrible people. Sinful people. Our Father is a merciful God. Yeshua is a merciful judge. He can also be very severe. And when God spanks, it's not just a slap on the wrist. He spanks hard when he spanks. I've felt a few of them. He spanks hard. Now we know, for example, how he treated Sodom and Gomorrah. And yet, Jesus said in Matthew 11, verses 20 to 24, in fact, especially verse 23 and 24. He says, you, Capernaum, I'm going to jump to verse 23 for time's sake here, who are exalted to heaven, 
you'll be brought down to the grave, to Hades. For if the mighty works which were done in you were done, had been done in Sodom, that city would have remained till this day. They would have repented. They would have changed. But you haven't. Capernaum, on the shores of the Sea of Galilee. But I say to you, it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for you. That's quite a statement. A tolerable time for Sodomites, according to Jesus. So speaking of Sodom, as still awaiting the day of judgment, they will have an easier time than Capernaum. And all those who died, never knowing Christ, even if they'd done very wicked, evil things, when God opens their mind and leads them to repentance like he did you and me, I believe most of them will repent. Most of them will use the Holy Spirit when they're given to help overcome. And they will be written in the book of life. When the sequence, the timing and all that is, there are some who have very definite ideas. I don't think the Bible is clear enough on every detail. All I know is I just read that even for Sodom, there's going to be a tolerable time. A good time, if you will, a better time. And all these people who are being resurrected, my son, your loved ones, the billions who have lived and died, they're not going to come up to, by that time, the end of the thousand years, they're not going to come to a world that's in disarray and destruction. No, they're going to come to a veritable Garden of Eden all over the whole world. Beautiful world. Healthy world. No more war after those from Gog, what's called the Gog and Magog, from all around the world that we just read about in Revelation 20. No more war after that. So be sure you're going to be there for the meaning of this day to greet those people being resurrected whom you know, who are part of your family, relatives and friends. Be sure you're there to meet them and maybe even have a time and a chance to resurrect them. Turn with me to Ezekiel 37. This is about the physical resurrection of the nation of, or the people of Israel. But we're told in the New Covenant, in Galatians 3, 26 to 28, there's no more Jew nor Gentile. We're all one now in Christ. So what's described here for Israel, I believe, will also happen for groups. That may not just be all Israel forever and ever, but in stages, I really believe. So we're reading one stage, one resurrection here, and I'm sure it'll be similar things said to, about Gentiles. Okay, Ezekiel 37, the valley of the dry bones, the hand of the Lord, Jehovah, came upon me, brought me out in the spirit of the Lord, and set me down in the midst of the valley. It was full of bones. He caused me to pass by them all around, and behold, there were so many in the open valley, and needed, indeed, they were very dry. He said, Son of man, can you bless, can, uh, can these bones live? He says, Oh, Lord God, you know. They look pretty dry and bony to me. Again, he said, Prophesy to those bones. Say to them, Oh, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. It's a song, you know. Them bones, them bones, gonna walk around. Them bones, bones, gonna walk around. Right? Anyway, thus, Jehovah God said to the bones, Surely I will cause breath to enter into you, and you shall live. I'll put sinews on you, and bring flesh upon you, cover you with skin, put breath in you, and you shall live. God wants these dead people to come back to physical life here in the second resurrection, and then have their minds open, be given the Holy Spirit, have their names written in the book of life, 
And at some point, some way, somehow, they too will become spirit being children of God. But not all at once. They have to overcome. They have to have God's spirit. They have to resist evil and temptation. So verse 7, so I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a noise and suddenly a rattling. And the bones came to together, bone to bone, you know, leg bone connected to the ankle bone and all that, right? Indeed, indeed, as I looked, the sinews and the flesh came upon them. The skin covered them. There was no breath in them. So also he said, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man. Say to the breath, thus says Jehovah God, come from the four winds, O breath. Breathe down the slain that they may live. And so I prophesied, and breath came into them, and they lived, and they stood upon their feet, an exceedingly great army. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This will happen for Gentiles too. This will happen for everybody who's dead. And then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They indeed say, Our bones are dry, our hope is are lost. We ourselves are cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves, and I'll cause you to come up from your graves and bring you to the land of Israel. And once there, you, then you shall know that I am Jehovah, I am the Lord. When I've opened your graves, O oh my people, and I have brought you up from your graves, I will put my spirit in you, and you shall live, and I will place you in your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, says Jehovah. So that's part of the second resurrection duplicated, I believe, in many, many stages over and over and over. Now, what exactly happens to that and how they become? They're given the Holy Spirit. So they're begotten of God's nature. So they certainly will have a wonderful time to, at, at, at some point where they'll, have, uh, they'll be ready to be a born spirit being child of God. Exactly how and when that happens, we're not told. There are people who speculate but we're not told, okay? And those who do not accept Jesus as Savior, those who do not accept the Holy Spirit, go against it, they will die waiting for the final resurrection with the rest who had been called before, who had the Holy Spirit, who rejected it, who fought God, who turned away from God permanently. Don't do that. This is your only, only time of salvation, folks. If you have God's spirit now, don't play with it. Don't play with it. Take it so seriously. So there's another resurrection for the ones who are forever lost. The wages of sin is death. Not the natural death that we all die from old age or whatever. Not that kind of death. It's appointed men once to die and after this the judgment. So there is a second death that we read about. In Revelation 20, remember it says those in the first resurrection, the second death can't touch them. They can't be harmed by the second death. They can't be killed again. They can't die ever again. So the second death is the death penalty. God is a merciful God, but if you don't take his mercy, then you come under his justice and you have to pay for your own death. If you don't take his son's death for you. So all the rest who knew better, rejected God, had had the Holy Spirit. Let's read it. Revelation 20, verse 13 to 15. Then the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Now, wait a minute. I thought all the dead already stand, were standing before God. They were. And they had the book of life open. And then after that, verse 13, the sea gave up their dead and everything in it. And death in the grave and Hades fought, delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one according to his works. And death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. That won't be us. In the first resurrection, that can't hurt us. Those in the second resurrection have a choice. Accept God, have eternal life, or reject God, turn away from God, be upset, be angry. 
whatever, decide to go Satan's way and be resurrected for the lake of fire. Then death, verse 14, and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Anyone, everyone really, not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. If you have God's Holy Spirit, you are in the book of life. I want to make sure it stays there. We'll be posting Hebrews 6 as I talk. Go ahead and start reading it. So what's left of all those who died? What's left are those who died, knowing about Christ, deciding to reject him. We all have one big shot, one big chance at being saved. But if we turn away from that, we'll burn in the lake of fire. Now is our only chance of salvation. 2 Corinthians 6.2 was written to Corinthians who were saints of God. Now is the day of salvation. That's true for those it was written to. Saints of God in Corinth. It's true for us. Now is our day of salvation. This is it. Hebrews 6, verse 4 to 6. It's impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit, have tasted the good word of God, the powers of the age to come, if they fall away, to renew them again to repentance since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to open shame. He's not going to be crucified more than once. These were people who were enlightened. They had their minds opened. Verse 4, partakers of the Holy Spirit, in bold print there. They rejected that. So what happens? Hebrews 10, verse 26 to 28 if we sin willfully, knowing we're doing wrong, we're going to do it anyway, we're not going to repent of it. Someone sinning willfully, someone who doesn't repent. We've received the knowledge of the truth. There no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment, fiery indignation, which will devour the adversaries. Anyone who rejected Moses' law dies without mercy at the testimony of two or three witnesses. So what you've got to understand is God is not right now trying to save the whole world. He's not. He's trying to save a small first fruits right now. And then when we return with Christ, the big harvest, pictured by the fall harvest, begin to take place. And all the people in the millennium will be the, our target audience. To bring them to repentance. To bring them to salvation. To bring them to come to know Jesus Christ. And then after that, there's the second resurrection of everyone who's ever died. And the Bible's open. We help them understand it. Like Philip did the Ethiopian eunuch. You will be doing that. And the Holy Spirit will be given to them. And the book of life is open. And we just read it. Revelation 12, uh, 20, verse 12 and 13. Or 11 and 12, whatever it was. But anyway, um, yeah, 11 and 12. And then after that, those who rejected their calling for salvation, they have to be penalized with the death penalty, the second death. That's the final resurrection. So I'm, I'm teaching, in a sense, three resurrections here. The first one to eternal life, the second one to physical life until you've proven to God that you will also accept Jesus as Savior. Take the Holy Spirit. The Valley of Dry Bones, remember the Holy Spirit was given to them. So once the Holy Spirit's given to you, it's just a matter of time then that you can be in the family of God as spirit beings in His timing and His way. Revelation 21. I don't know what on earth I did here. Hang on a second. Revelation 21, verse 1. Let's 
here somewhere. And then I saw, this is, uh, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and earth had passed away. There was no more sea. Peter says, 2 Peter 3, verses 10 into 13, the day of Jehovah will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise. God gave him this understanding, I guess. Elements will melt with fervent heat. The earth and all the works in it will be burned up. So by this time, everyone who has gone God's way is a spirit being. Fire won't affect them, us. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening for the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, the elements will melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens, new earth, in which righteousness dwells. This is why they are to dwell in booths for seven days. Temporariness. The eighth day pictures this time when things become permanent. The universe as we know it will go, will be dissolved. Black holes sucking everything in. And I think the universe is gorgeous, but it has all the scars of Satan's rebellion. Imagine the battle that took place between angelic forces when he rebelled many, many, many years ago. Imagine being able to watch the universe being dissolved and burning up in fervent heat and powerful black holes sucking in and dissolving everything. Billions of galaxies with trillions of stars somehow coming to naught. Suddenly, all disappearing. And those are all physical. God doesn't want physical, he wants spirit. I'm absolutely convinced the universe that we're going to have is going to be a spirit universe. Absolutely convinced the holy city is all spirit gold, spirit pearls, spirit streets. Because Jesus said, invest in the kingdom of heaven where neither moth nor rust, right? There's no corruption there. This corruptible must put on incorruption. There's no dust and dirt and weeds and stuff. Still, I love watching the pictures from the Hubble telescope and even the newer one now, the James Webb Space Telescope. Fantastic pictures. Yeah, the James Webb uh, tel uh, space, tel space Telescope, incredible pictures. And then what? New heaven and new earth. There's no more record of Satan's rebellion now. It's a spirit universe. Okay, and it's a spirit. Everything's going to be new. New heavens and new earth. Revelation 21, verse 2 to 14. I, I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. On the first day, I gave a sermon about God's desire to tabernacle with us. He did at the Garden of Eden. He walked and talked with Adam and Eve. He did when Israel was camping. He had a tabernacle right on the ground with them, camping right out with the Israelite campers. And he asked them to build him a tabernacle. He was delighted when David suggested, how about you have a building, a, a temple? How about that? And, uh, and then he came to tabernacle with us as Christ. So anyway, here, uh, prepared as a bride, uh, you know, behold, the tabernacle of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. Remember uh, Isaiah 46.10, that God declares the end from the beginning? We're seeing it happen right here. God himself will be, there, be with them and be their God. God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death. No more, no more sorrow, no more crying. No more pain. I've done a lot of crying in my life. I've had a lot of pain of sorrow and other kinds of pain. My brother sure has, my sister. 
The former things have passed away. Remember eight means new. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things, I make everything new. Everything new. And he said, Right, for these words are true, faithful. And he said to me, It's done. I'm Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. Verse 7, He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I'll be his God, and he shall be my child, my son. But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their place in the lake. Which He's meaning those who don't repent and overcome those things. Those who do overcome will inherit all things. We just read that in verse 7. So they had sins to overcome as well. But he's saying in verse 8, but if you want to remain the way you are and you won't let Christ live in you and become a new life, and you won't change, and you will keep lying, and you will keep committing adultery, you'll commit, keep on murdering, and all those things. No, you're not going to be part of this. You'll be part of the second death. The end of verse 8. Then one of the seven angels said, Come, I'll show you the bride, the lamb's wife. And he carried me in the spirit to a great and high mountain, verse 10. Revelation 21, verse 10. And... Uh, showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God to the earth. Having the glory of God, her light was like a most precious stone, like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. She had a great wall. Now, it's calling the city the bride because I believe that we, we're, we are also called the bride. It's because that is our city. That is our city. It's identified with us. Everybody else will have other cities. You might want to hear my sermon about um, uh, our God, our kingdom, our, our city, and so on. Just put in our God, our kingdom, and I think it will show up. Had a great high wall, 12 gates, the 12 angels at the gates, names written on the gates, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. Three on each side, because the city's like a square. Now the wall, verse 14, had 12 foundations, and on those foundations were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. And they took out a measuring rod, and basically verse 16, 17, and 18 says that this city is um, something like 2,200 kilometers, 2,200 kilometers, 2,253 kilometers. It's 1,400 miles I used to think it was 1,500, but it seemed to be 1,400 miles wide, long, so it's a square, and high. Now, whether it's a cube or whether the height goes up like a mountain, which is my preference, I think it would be much more beautiful, as a mountain, and it's called the mountain of the Lord, many, many places. So I think the heavenly Jerusalem probably will look like a mountain. The size of it right now would fill one half of the United States, would fill much of Africa, much of it. 1,500 miles, 2,200, 2,253 kilometers high. Mount Everest is five or six miles high, and that's it. This is 1,400 miles high, 1,400 wide and long. Foundations were decorated with every precious stone. Verse 19, you can read them. The 12 gates were made of a single pearl each. That's a big pearl. <laughs> There's no temple in the city because God and Christ are the temple. Anyway, so, um, so to me, this day is not just a doctrine. This day is about my son. Going to chapter 22. I don't have time to read it all, but we'll post it, part of it. He showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from, proceeding from the throne of God of the, and of the Lamb in the middle of the street. And on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore twelve fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. Anyway, it goes on from there. I want you to really study this carefully. Verse 7, Behold, I'm coming quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. And then what? The Bible doesn't tell us then what. 
All I know is this is just a new beginning. It's not the end. It's a new beginning. So at some point, God the Father will get us all together. Say, I'll bet you're all wondering what's going to happen next. And then he'll tell us. Or he might leave us in suspense still. All I know is I want to be part of that kingdom. And that glory. And that peace. And that joy. And that love. I don't want to miss it. I don't want you to miss it. Let's encourage each other not to give it up. When we're down, lift each other up. When someone has to be put out even, encourage them. They can come back. We need all of you in the, in the, in, in the army of God. We need all of you in the flock of God. All of you. By being in the first fruits, our reward is double. By being in the first fruits, we get to watch the massive resurrections of billions. Maybe help with it. And help make the Garden of Eden become a worldwide reality. This is the time when, on this eighth day when you will see your deceased, your dead loved ones again. This is the day I'll be reunited with my son David, our son David. Maybe get a chance to resurrect him. We will teach them. We will raise them. We'll lead them. We're training now to be the kind of leaders we should be by the way we try to be as husbands and mothers and husbands and wives and just normal people who love other people. We need to be practicing all of that now. We'll get to watch the new creation of the whole new universe and spirit. All things new. This day is about the whole universe being new, our lives being new, being one with the Father, with each other, with Yeshua, one body, one perfect love. We'll be the bride and the co-ruler of this universe if we don't lose heart, give it all up. Day eight. What an exciting, wonderful day. Thank you, Abba. Thank you, Father in heaven. Dear Father. So until next time, this is Philip saying goodbye. Let's ask our Messiah and our Father in heaven to bless us and give you all a safe trip home tomorrow. Father in heaven, we come before you. Hallelujah. It means we all praise Yah. We all praise you. Praise you, Jesus, also. You who came for us, gave your life for us. Of your own account, you said. So all this process I've been talking about that you've been revealing can happen because of what you are and have done. Oh God in heaven, speed the day when we can all return together to Mount of Olives, start the process of fixing this world, finally being part of real solutions. So I pray you pour out your Holy Spirit on everyone who's heard this. Let us have more vigor, more joy, more energy than we've ever had. Let us go out there and share this with everybody else and help us be willing to talk about it. Help us to bring disciples and help us to prepare your body for you, a church for you, ready for you. Help us overcome. Help us change by letting Christ be our life. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father in heaven, for what a wonderful Father you are. How merciful, how patient you've been with all of us. We praise you. We thank you. Lift up our hands in joy to you. Praise to you. Please help people have a safe trip tomorrow night once they start leaving to go home. Thank you for the feast. Thank you for this eighth day. Thank you for your guardian angels. We thank you for everything you are. In Yeshua, in Jesus' mighty name.
Amen. Visit the Light on the Rock website where you can view additional videos, over 600 sermons and blogs as a scriptural study reference for those who desire to have a closer relationship with God the Father and His Son Jesus Christ and learn more about His incredible plan for all mankind. We are not a church, but a nonprofit organization providing in-depth biblical studies free for all who would like to visit our site. The Light on the Rock Foundation also supports an orphanage in Kenya, providing financial resources to support their living costs and education. We never ask for money. However, any donations are greatly appreciated and will be used to support the Kenyan Orphanage and our site. Thank you for visiting. And if you find the site beneficial to you and your family, please share with others.